and he is going to talk about a refinement of Vizaus lemma and elements of order three in some rational quaternion algebra. And take it away. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks to the organizers. It's part of the magic of quaternions, I think, that if you've been in the session today, start uh, thinking combinatorially, pretty soon you're folding paper, and then your beautiful demonstrations geometric uh, in nature. Are you guys ready for some number theory now? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> All right, so this is joint work with Donald Cotwright and Xavier Rouleau. Okay, does everybody know the Zeus lemma? It starts out like this. You take two integers, a and b, which I'll take to be positive, that are relatively prime. There's a theorem that is attributed to the zoo, but actually goes back to Vachet in 1624. As usual, you can always tell who didn't prove a theorem by who it's named after. The <laughs> um, zoo did something for polynomials, not integers. But the statement is that you can find other integers, u and d, with the property that a u minus b v is equal to 1. And we call these the Bazoo coefficients, or a set of Bazoo coefficients for a and b. I always thought these had to do with the extended Euclidean algorithm. It somehow went back all the way to Euclid, but this came much uh, later, in fact. So the kind of vibe of the talk today is what extra conditions can we put on these Bazoo coefficients? So although they, their existence is guaranteed by the extended Euclidean algorithm, maybe I want u and v to have some extra property along the way. That's what number theorists like to do. We see integers in front of us, and we would like to do more with them. OK, well, there's no mystery about what the set of those possible integers are. Maybe that's enough of an answer uh, to the question to get started. Um, they're completely parameterized in the following way. If you can produce one solution like from the extended Euclidean algorithm, then you get all of the rest of them by adding a multiple of b to one and a multiple of a to the other exactly so that it will cancel out. You can visualize this really nicely uh, as if you consider uh, a u minus b v as describing a line in the plane, what you've done is you've drawn one point on that line, and you ask for all of the primitive points on that line, and the a over b is the slope, uh, depending on what coordinates that you're taking. So no mystery there. Uh, in particular, uh, because a and b were taken to be positive, and you can take t sufficiently positive, we can always assume that both u and v themselves are positive. That's a sample thing that you might ask for the pursuit coefficient. Um, what else might you like to do? Maybe you want u and v to have some additional congruence properties. Um, and that's also no big deal, as you can see from the explicit uh, representation there. If you want to pick one of the congruence classes to be a certain thing, and you stay away from the primes dividing a and b, no big deal. You can solve for t and, and get something according. All right, usually when I give talks, I have to apologize for the quaternions because they're coming later. In this case, I feel like I better apologize. I have a little bit more number theory to tell you before we get to the quaternions. Can you wait? Oh, yeah. Yes. I, just, I like to think of quaternions as being like uh, non-commutative quadratic fields. That's been a real sort of source of inspiration for all kinds of analogies, which is one of my favorite things to do in math. So I want to pursue this quadratic analogy first a little bit, and then it will tell us what to do with our quaternions. Okay, so I'm not done. Here's another, here's the, the first move, which is just to ask, can I have u and v, these bazoo coefficients, themselves be squares? It's a pretty uh, substantial thing to ask for those integers. It's no longer a positivity condition or something that will happen for a positive proportion of the time, but it's a 0% probability event, but maybe interesting still. Well, you end up instead with this diaphantine equation, partially explaining my choices of notation. And uh, this has been studied before. Do you recognize it? Um, does it look familiar? Well, uh, OK. I got to get the quaternions in uh, as quickly as possible. So just as a, uh, as a news bouche, um, here's one way in which quaternions can show up. Instead of asking for x and y to be integers, which is certainly necessary for our pursuit coefficients, at least could we find them with rational coefficients? That's something that you might ask. And if so, then presumably for this audience, I do not need to say, this is the Hilbert equation. So to have a solution ax squared minus by squared equals 1, that's exactly the condition for this quaternion algebra to find over q with coefficients a minus b to be isomorphic to the 2 by 2 matrices over q. All right, good. I feel like we have our first <laughs> quaternionic refreshment. All right, so uh, 
Um, when do we have such a splitting behavior? Well, A and B were co prime. We know that A and B are positive, so there's nothing going on in infinity. Um, that means I also don't have to worry about 2 because of the parity conditions for quaternion algebras over Q. So I have to check a uh, condition at P, and exactly that depends on if uh, uh, the B is a square modulo the primes dividing A and vice versa. This is the Hilbertson. I have nothing new to tell you there, but uh, even this level, we begin to see the quaternions emerging from something very simple. Now these are just necessary, not sufficient conditions. They're necessary and sufficient over Q, but if we want to refine this over Z, we have to do a bit more work. Right, so this is the slide that continues that on. This is the equation that we're interested in. And the way to get an into, to ask the question, do I have the solution over Z, is to recognize it as a norm equation. It doesn't look like that yet, but I can make it so by making a slight shift of variables. Maybe another name that you might give it is the not quite Pell equation. You know the Pell equation, x squared minus d, y squared. How will we make it look like a Pell equation, and therefore also a norm equation? Multiply through by a, and pull that into x, right? So if you scale that top equation, you get now quantity ax squared minus a, b, y squared is equal to a. So let's let d be the product of a and b, and I assume so to avoid trivialities that a and b, their product is bigger than 1. And now, does everybody see that as being, if you factor the left-hand side, like x squared, x plus root d, and x minus root d, y? Except I have this extra condition that the first coefficient it has to be divisible by a. But that's uh, all I need to finish the answer to the question. If you know some number theory, I hope this looks familiar. If it doesn't, I hope it inspires you to go out and read more about uh, what the la in the language of binary quadratic forms what happens. But if you consider this ideal inside the ring z root d, um, well, it, I've just written it as a z lattice there, but in fact it is an ideal. It's closed under multiplication by z root d. And then this has a solution if and only if um, that this solution is an element of norm A inside that ideal. And if I have an ideal of norm A and an element of norm A in that ideal, that is equivalent to saying that that ideal is narrowly principal. It's generated by element with positive norm. And so now I've identified the failure of the lo integral local global principle. Naturally, it's given by a class set. Um, that is uh, an element of the narrow class group of the quadratic order z root d of discriminant 4d as a necessary and sufficient condition for an integer solution. All right, does that make sense? All right, so let's try to think of a quaternionic analog of this situation. Not that the coefficients are squares, but is there a quaternionic not quite hell equation? Okay, that's what's, that's what's coming. Um, if you want it, you can make infinitely many solutions, just like in the Pell equation, by multiplying by units. Okay, so here's where the quaternions come in. Instead of asking for them to be squares, with the norm equation of root d, we ask instead that the elements u and v themselves are norms from some other auxiliary quadratic extension. So, uh, I have a 20-minute talk, and I wanted to see as much time as possible to briefly one graph, so I will try to end as timely as I can. <laughs> I'm just going to focus on a special case, but it's got all the great ideas in it. We're working on our various generalizations. So here it is. I just take a primitive uh, cube root of unity, and uh, I'm going to ask that my u and v are norms from the Eisenstein integers. So this is the ring of integers, or the field, q adjoins square root of minus 3. It's kind of amazing, but the set of norms from the Eisenstein integers, they have their own name. Um, they're called the Luschian numbers after Lush, who was a mathematician economist, I think, uh, more than that. And gosh, everyone here should have their own numbers. Uh, <laughs> so go out there and invent it and get somebody to name it after you. Okay. So how do you describe the Luschian numbers? Well, this is what the norm of an element x plus omega y looks like. Uh, it's not x squared plus y squared like you would have for the Gaussian integers, but uh, still something very familiar. I remark to you that those norms are always greater than or equal to zero by completing the square, and I also remark by uh, completing the square in a different way, that's not really complete, right? manipulating algebraically that uh, you only get integers that are zero or one mod three. And if you want to think about what integers you actually get that way, it turns out that that set of integers is, uh, uh, if you take the non 
the zero one, so the strictly positive elements, that is a free monoid under multiplication generated by these? Did I scare you? I hope not. I just mean you can multiply, not necessarily divide, a group without that. It does have an identity, one, inside. And what you get are three, the primes that are one mod three, and the squares of primes that are two mod three. So that is the set of the two numbers. It is uh, uh, still a set of, uh, which does not have positive density, so it is an X condition, but it should be easier to satisfy than that harder condition that we had about the human being squares. So the task before us is to decide when can I take my Bazoo coefficients to be Gaussian numbers. Okay, you never know am I going too fast or too slow. The, the answer, here comes the quaternions. <laughs> well, first of all, the answer is not always yes. Um, if you take five and three, um, I can find one solution, 10 minus nine is one. I showed you the general solution. I can add a multiple of three and a multiple of two. But unfortunately, if u is always going to be two plus three t, that's never a Lucian number because it's always two mod three. Okay, that seems intense. Okay, but uh, it's a minor inconvenience, it turns out. If you just swap five three with three five, then you get this expression, and seven is one mod three, and four is two squared. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have been so harsh about asking for AU minus BV equals one. I mean, what are the special roles of A and B? I ordered them and now I'm not asking them to be ordered. So let's relax a little bit, especially on a Saturday afternoon, and look at an equation that's equal to plus or minus one instead of actually equal to one. That, that means we don't care about the particular ordering anymore. And like any 20 minute talk, you've got to get to your beer before the end, right organizers? Um, if you take a and b positive integers, b the product of the two, then there are infinitely many u and v Lucian numbers that give me the zoo coefficients if I allow the plus or minus one. So it is always possible, in fact, infinitely many ways if I uh, allow the order to be swapped. And there, it's a nice little interview. It was my theorem, so I really <laughs> I can't have backup chances. I do some kind of musical indication that we have reached the high point of the talk. Um, part B is just uh, additional congruential information, which was relevant for uh, obviously interesting things are happening in three, so you might want also some properties of divisibility like three. The main point was A. Okay? So that is the conclusion of the talk. It's always possible to do so. Why? The answer is uh, the answer is always quaternions, no matter what the question was. At least if you hang out with me for too long. Um, quaternions. So what kind of equation do you get if you ask for u to be the norm of mu and v to be the norm of nu? Um, well, you have to plug in the formula that we gave for the norm on the previous slide. Instead of ax squared minus u squared equals plus or minus 1, now we have four variables because they come from each of the coordinates. And, uh, <coughs> Do you recognize this as the non-commutative analog of the quadratic thing that we saw earlier? I can it is also a norm equation. It's a quaternion norm equation, or you might would like to think of it as a not quite quaternion Pell equation, if you will allow me to say that. Uh, what did we do before in order to see the norm equation? Scale through by A. You can do the same thing too. We'll end up with some conditions on divisibility. So let's just rinse and repeat, but with our quaternionic soap, I guess. Um, so what is it a norm from? Well, with relevant quaternion algebra, I already have this q root minus 3 with its ring of integers, mm -hmm. and that's the first a that will apply in my quaternion algebra, a different a, but what we usually call for quaternion. And then uh, I want to add an element j whose square is equal to d, and I ask these to skew commute in the way that uh, after I complete the square. Um, the way that you say that is that the penalty for moving j past omega is not that it is skew commute, but you get its Galois conjugate instead, the other q root of unity. Um, if I ask for z omega to retain its multiplication and addition laws, this completely determines the multiplication on that quaternion. It's not what we usually do. I mean, doesn't everybody feel congenitally like we should complete the square? That's going <laughs> to introduce a factor of two. So it's okay to do it to the quaternion algebra, but this order itself wants to be treated uh, as is. 
So now um, what we want to solve is this equation rescaled by A, which looks like this. So it's very similar to the quadratic case. I have to solve A mu plus mu, and its reduced norm is equal to A. So when do quaternion norm equations have a solution? There probably is some uh, local global principle and an obstruction thereof. Right, just repeating the stuff on the bottom of the slide at the top of the next slide, so it's the relevant parts. Um, all right, well, this is a quaternion session, so now let me tell you a whole lot about the quaternion algebra and the order O. Of course, if you want to know more about this, if this goes by a little fast, I have a very, I wrote a very slender volume that will provide <laughs> relevant information for you, um, but uh, I will show you a sampling of what that might include. So first of all, I just indicated to you when a prime is ramified in that quaternion algebra or not has to do with um, the primes dividing if they're 2 mod 3 and if the divisibility of this product A and B is odd. The order itself has reduced discriminant 3 times D. And how do we describe this order? Will we do so locally? So you tensor the order with the piadic integers. And then you look at its Jacobson radical, and then you take the quotient. So that will be a finite FP algebra. And if you want to think in the non-commutative analog of the quadratic case, this is analogous to asking, does the prime has three choices, right? It is either split, ramified, or inert. The same thing is true here. It's just a general phenomenon that instead you have a Jacobson radical, like the maximal ideal. Um, you take the quotient and you get a semi-simple FP algebra. And again, there's three possibilities. And here, they all uh, do arise uh, in this case. First of all, if P doesn't divide the reduced discriminant, you just get the matrix ring. If P is, divides N and it's 1 mod 3, then the order is called residually split and Eichler order. Those are everyone's favorite types of quaternion orders, but those only happen for the primes that are 1 mod 3. There's another thing that happens. P might be inert in the quaternion order. We call those residually inert. Sometimes they're called Kaiser orders. And those are the primes that are 2 mod 3. N. And of course, there's always p is equal to 2 a pain, but in this case, it's p is equal to 3 being a pain. Uh, this order is either hereditary or what we say residually ramified, depending on if 3 exactly divides a, b, or more. So I hope this provided some comfort for you, but we really do understand the local properties of this order, and then I'm going to try to apply that to a local to global principle to see about the norm solution. Okay, so I remind you that the right class set of O, just like in the commutative case, a set of classes of invertible right O ideals under the natural equivalence of differing on the left by um, uh, a generator. And the proposition is quite remarkable. This order, independent of the parameters, always has class number one. Now, non-commutative rings are supposed to be harder than commutative rings. How is that a possibility? No, no, it's got enough quadratic extensions for them to kind of cancel out and give you class number one. That's the amazing thing. So, it's, you know, if you aren't at already in love with quaternions, you probably should be by the end of this kind of remarkable result. Actually, commutative rings are harder, um, at least from this class set perspective. Um, but that really is the uh, end of the group. I'm going to have to zoom past this, this stuff that I won't be able to tell you the details of Bruce's proposition. I we took that time for uh, the, the demo, and I'm happy to skip that. Maybe I'll tell you at least this. Uh, the reason for this, the slogan is ideal classes are determined by their reduced norms in a rate class group. So the class set is no harder than the class set of C, which C is a PID, and that's all you need. All right, so everybody close your eyes while I skip through a couple of slides. This contained the proof. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, you don't want to see that. Right? So <laughs> In my one minute left, I remind you we're trying to solve this quaternionic norm equation. We know all right ideals are principal invertible ones. So you know what? I make the same kind of ideal that I did in the commutative case. I just consider the lattice. This is the, I want my elements to come from this lattice. So I just take my reduced norm and I say what happens on this lattice. I know it happens to be uh, locally principal. It has norm, reduced norm A. So I also know that it's principal generated by some alpha. That alpha also has, therefore, norm plus or minus A, because the ideal had norm A. And that is my solution. I can now divide the x-coordinate by A, and I'm all set. You get infinitely many by multiplying by the units of, 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 of norm 1. OK, so uh, 
my last slide, this was the main theorem. I hope it will stay with you studying extra conditions on the zoo coefficient turned into a norm, quaternionic norm equation, which always had a solution by a class number uh, computation. I mentioned in my title, this allows us to count elements of order three using local embedding numbers. Um, and the, I did not start out by playing around with Lotian numbers. The reason why this came to me was we wanted to understand the ways of writing a generalized Coomer surface uh, as an abelian surface with elements of order three, and you get talking to people, and then pretty, well, if you have quaternion problems, I'm your man, I'm happy to help you, no matter where they, they come from, abelian varieties or whatnot, but I uh, spare you those details. I hope the problem itself was self-motivating. And if you like this, and you ask things beyond Q squared minus three, that is work in progress. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions to here? Yeah, I have some uh, few questions. What, uh, the, how do you put the sum without the zoom number? Um, two, if you use plus or minus one of your initial uh, example, you get the red shot and the plus. Yes, yes. And you, you can know that you get GCD1 um, without having to know that you can reverse the steps that you put it over. And then my last one. <laughs> if you wish. Can I? Yes. <laughs> but I will, I will return the favor at the next opportunity. So my first question, uh, how did you put the proof in the It's a good question. We'll have to go back to the original elements. I wasn't aware of that. That was a thing why, why would we call it the bazooka coefficients? Yeah, the history there must be more interesting than I'm even oversimplifying. I'm just claiming it doesn't, it's not, it's really proved by Mache. The only way I that's how we typically do it in a number theory class, but I wonder if that is, uh, reflects the history or not. Yeah? Well, if you're from a real quadratic field, Um, nothing goes wrong in a real quadratic <laughs> field. They're just as great. Um, uh, you mean if I ask for norms from real quadratic fields? That's right. That's a great question. Uh, the conditions at infinity change, so we won't always be guaranteed a solution. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should stop. It will be identifying the obstruction to a solution, just like we did in the quadratic case, um, by saying that the class set might be not trivial. And now you have a solution if and only if uh, this ideal happens to be true. So it's not a problem, it's just uh, the direct generalization, for example, if P is always is 3 mod 4, like, then minus P will uh, always have a solution. Okay. Any more questions? Let's give John another round of applause.